We never know where life will lead us or what may hinder us along the way. But while every day can feel like one big question mark, it doesn't have to. With the right insights, strategies, and solutions from Western and Southern Financial Group, together we can look ahead to leave the unknown behind. Mike, the movie we watched last night, I have two things. The movie we watched last night, Baby Driver from 2017, is objectively one of the worst movies I've ever seen. I thought it was a That's satire so half terrible. the time. I, th I thought, was it satire or was it real? Were they like making a joke or was it not a joke? It looked like a script. It felt like a script that was written by a director that just graduated and followed like the action plot of movies that normally star Jason Statham, but instead starred this like other guy. It was, it was not good. It was like fantastical. It was supposed to be like that. I don't know. I didn't hate it. Yeah, like you, who I was just called one of the worst movies of all time. I thought it was just fine. I hated it. I hated fine. it. Um, the other thing I had, it was hilarious. I think the first roommate moment where I was like laughing is like, all right, I got the Wi-Fi set up. What should we change the name to? Three Raw Dogs. And then we think uh, Password Boner 69. And it just felt so bro -y to a T, like unprompted. I was like, Mike, we can't get into this this early. <laughs> we need to be more adults here. When people come over, I don't think we want to be telling people the password's Boner 69. Even though I know the boys are back together. We're roommates now. I feel like we got to go with the better password. Yeah, I was messing around to a degree there. I, I thought three raw dogs would have been funny, but then we ended up not even being able to change our Wi-Fi name as uh, so. So now, we, IP, now our Wi-Fi name is Cincinnati four one eight, which sucks. Really sucks. Not as good as the other Wi-Fi we had. We had some good plans, but on the catch and early buzz, outside of obviously roommate living, um, the house we haven't given a good name to it yet. The Wi-Fi also not a good name, but who knows? Catch and early buzz. The Rams Super Bowl parade looks pretty barren, man. I think I had I I had this take on. Not this take, I brought up this story on a previous episode, but when I was at Target talking to the cashier, it was like, he's like, oh, who's in the Super Bowl this year? I was like, the Rams and the Bengals. He's like, where's it being played? I was like, LA at SoFi Stadium. He's like, I don't even know what SoFi is. <laughs> I was like, all right. And that was evident in how many people showed up to this freaking parade today. It was very, um, it was not that many people. I'll say that. Yeah, I'll just say when I was in LA, a guy behind me in line said he didn't want the Rams to win. Because he didn't want a parade. He no, he didn't. Literally didn't want or didn't want the sort of upheaval and jovial joviality that comes with the parade and winning and whatever that. He didn't even want the Rams to win. He lives in LA, didn't even want the Rams to win. That was pretty sad. But I mean, what do you expect? Like it it goes back to the whole fan bases are more involved when that's all they have to do. Mm -hmm. When you're in LA and you can literally do anything you want in the world. You're not – football is just going to be on the back burner for a lot of people. When you're in Plus, Green like, Bay, the Rams Wisconsin, are new to L.A., right? I mean, they just got back to L.A. When you're in Green Bay, Wisconsin. Yeah, and, and the, again, they don't have an inbuilt fan base there from, you know, being there for forever. They were in St. Louis for years. So when you're in Green Bay, Wisconsin, though, and you're cooped up in your house for six months out of the year or shoveling snow or doing things that aren't necessarily the most, shall we say, stimulating comparatively – you get very involved in football, mm -hmm. as I know. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it, it, Big you're, surprise. you're not even compare, comparing the same sport, in my opinion, if you compare LA football fandom to Green Bay fandom. Yeah. If the Green Bay Packers yeah. win the Super Bowl and you're walking around Green Bay, no cashier, we're like, who's in the Super Bowl? Where is it being played? Everyone in that city would know where it was happening. And they'd all, the city would shut down for when the Packers were in the Super Bowl. Yeah, when they won back in 2010, I was in college, I was a sophomore, I believe. I'm trying to remember sophomore college skipped school the next day drove to green bay with my brother and we went to the parade just because they didn't even think about it we're just like that's what we're gonna do like, it has to no, be done yeah exactly it has to be done outside of the Rams super bowl parade um we're shedding a tear for the aaron Rodgers, shaylen woodley i'm gonna throw miles teller into there too right i mean miles teller's a part of be that. happy about this no there's no way i mean that vacation is objectively better with miles teller shaylen woodley no more jam sessions with the boys and man you hate man. to see it now, 
I'll just say this as someone who is dated, and this goes back to Shailen Woodley, that one interview dated, she gave. Can you, someone who's dated in general or just okay, dated? No, I'll get back. I didn't finish my thought on that one or didn't finish what I was going to say. But Shailen Woodley goes back to the interview where she said, where she basically said, like, I don't watch football. I never thought I'd be with a football player. I dated a girl like that, as you can probably attest to. Um, it doesn't work. Like, whether, like, if that is your life, if your life is something, it's my life is football and Roger's life is football. Don't compare and yourself yeah. like that. And I'm just saying, when like that is your passion, <laughs> that that's his primary passion. Like Career that, and that's passion. his life. And it's like, and, and yes, he has other interests. As I have other interests, he probably has more other interests than I do, like researching COVID. <laughs> but if that is your main passion and you don't share that to to a, any sort of degree with your partner. It's just going to be difficult, mm -hmm. and I'm not like here to psychoanalyze. I'm just Dude, saying I, for, okay, the, for, all the, for all the boys out there listening, if that that is something that you are thinking about, and I actually was just talking with one of my buddies who works at the overtime about this, who just started dating a girl, and he said he doesn't even not even into football at all. And I'm like, if that's something you're passionate about, it's just it's going to going to have some conflict. I mean, it's not make conflict, the just challenge challenges in terms of communicating in terms of being on the same page. No, I would agree with you. I think it, a, a relationship is a lot more challenging when your partner is not as involved in your, I think that the issue comes up, right. And I think this is turning into a relationship advice podcast could be great for TikTok. Mm. The issue comes up when your career and your passions are like very much intertwined, right? Cause people yeah. are like in love with their career, but if their passions outside of their career or something that like their partner can be more close to. Cause like, you yeah, can, like yeah, yeah. Shailene Woodley, like she could be the biggest football fan in the world. Doesn't matter. Like what Aaron Rodgers is doing in football is completely different than what Shailene Woodley could ever do in football. She's not gonna be like help coach and like fucking they're not gonna watch tape together. It's the same thing if like, you're really passionate about football and you're really passionate about your job. And you're not gonna help you like grind the tape for the draft guide and stuff like that. But to, but to not understand it at all is what I'm saying. Is okay. Where you start to get, get well, I, I, can I finish with this? I just wish them the best. Yeah. And I hope Aaron Rodgers finds someone new. And I will say the best joke. So there were a lot of jokes, right, with the Shailen Woodley, Aaron Rodgers split. I saw a lot of like vaccine jokes, like Aaron Rodgers uh, decided to break up with her when she asked for one more shot. Like that kind of stuff I thought was bad. Like those jokes were bad. Nicole Auerbach, however, who writes for The Athletic, did quote tweet the story and said, damn, Aaron Rodgers still looking for that second ring. That was good. Like that's a solid joke i i, I, I don't think it's funny i, I respect funny. that one i think that heartbreak one's got almost, is tragedy i there's no laughing matter here to me that one's got almost ten thousand likes and rightfully so in my opinion um that's it for the catch and early buzz let's get into these off-season game plans free and draft game plans before we do the present the podcast is presented by DraftKings hoops fans the latest offer from DraftKings sportsbook an official sports betting partner of the nba is too good to pass up I'm just I'm talking between the legs 360 windmill good. I don't know I can if do when I say that me and how I look says that says that I don't know if it comes off great. Yeah. I'm talking between the legs 360 windmill good. New customers can bet just $1 on like any team and is, get I'll keep going sorry. New customers can bet just $1 on any team and get $150 in free bets if they win. It's that simple. If Sportsbook isn't available in your state yet, you can still take your shot at a big payday. Everyone can play for huge cash prizes with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Basketball Contest. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code PFF. Bet just $1 on any NBA team to get $150 in free bets if they win. That's promo code PFF at DraftKings Sportsbook. An official sports betting partner of the NBA must be 21 years or older. Minimum age and location requirements vary by jurisdiction. See DraftKings.com slash Sportsbook for a full list of requirements and state-specific responsible gaming resources. Gambling problem called 1-800-GAMBLER. That's between the legs 360 windmill good. Mm. What I was going to say is that between the legs is almost like by definition a windmill because you're taking it from that low and having to bring it back up but you don't have which is to what go a 360 legs to do windmill yes yeah but like i'm saying a windmill by definition is just bringing it down lower than your like below your waist i've always been a big fan of the back scratcher the two hand i call that tomahawk oh, tomahawk's really? probably the most fun dunk to do uh, in a game. Oh, I would agree 100%. I, I, uh, yeah. I, I've done a lot of dunks in games, and I think tomahawks are probably my favorite. Tomahawk really feels good, yeah. I will say. It's that uh, or like the one where I'm able to go up and put my elbow into the basket and okay. hang on it. Yeah. That's my um, probably my jar. second favorite dunk. Yeah. Is that the cookie jar? Yeah. 
That's usually my favorite. If I, I usually bust that out. Um, let's get to something else that's 360 windmill dunk good. AFC and NFC South game plans, offseason game plans, starting with the Tennessee Titans, who, of all the teams in the AFC South, have the best odds to win the AFC, and they're still only sixth. Offseason resources rank, if you've been listening to the last few episodes, this is a composite rank of available cap space, movable cap space, and draft capital. Ranks 30th in the NFL with negative $7.1 million right now in available cap space. They can make some cuts. Roger Saffold, if cut, saves them about 10 mils. At Cunningham, 12 mil. Janoris Jenkins, 7 mil. So there's a lot of movement to be had there, but they don't have a lot of draft capital either. Like This is not an offseason where you can say, let's add multiple pieces to get this team over the hump. Like This is a te- team that needs to make you know, some cost friendly decisions and try and, you know, strike gold a bit on some guys maybe take willing to take, you know, lower end deals. Yeah. So this is the year that the Tannehill contract there that he signed back, I believe it was before twenty twenty, really comes to roost. Thirty eight point six million dollar cap hit this year. That's kind of why I floated the Ryan Tannehill for Baker Mayfield swap, because they would get if they trade him, they would get some of that money. Uh, off the books there. And that's going to hamper them. When you're paying a guy like Ryan Tannehill $38.6 million, when his cap hits in the range of guys who are better quarterbacks than him, you're just in a difficult spot in roster building. So moves to make, I do think you have to do some things to clear that cap. Roger Saffold, $10 million. Zach Cunningham, $12 million. Being over the cap as they are, like, Yes, make those moves. I, I do think where they have to go with that money is rebuilding its offensive line. They were bad in pass protection down the stretch. And now, yeah, you drafted a guy in the second round last year, Dylan Raidens. Hopefully he's the right tackle in the future. Hopefully your tackles are still in place. Taylor DeWan, Dylan Raidens. Hopefully that's solid. Nate Davis at right guard. But you got to get some more depth on this offensive line. If you're going to spend any money anywhere, that's probably where I would lean because, I mean, it's a good roster. It really is a good roster. This defense has a lot of young talent. Um, but again, you don't have much room to work with. I would to maybe start to try to lock down this 2019 draft class, maybe to t- touch early, but guys like A.J. Brown, guys like Jeffrey Simmons, start to look towards extensions for those guys because to maybe free up a touch of space because, in the future because you – like I said, you have a very good roster here. You were the one seed in the AFC. Um, they they just need a little smoothing out at positions, like I said, especially off the line. I am excited to see if this Tennessee Titans offense can stay fully healthy for a 17-game season, right? Mm-hmm. I think the bigger concern with Tennessee, and they still landed the one seed, right? We had Keyline Fred on this bitch talking about, you know, Matt, Mike Vrabel as coach of the year with all that they did and, and going through um, – uh, going through injuries and those things, right? Julio Jones did not play a lot for them last year. Even A.J. Brown got hurt, and then obviously the Derrick Henry injury. I don't know how much needs to be done to the offense and those skill players. They just need yeah. to stay healthy. And yeah. maybe adding some insurance that isn't Nick Westbrook-Akina, right, or Des Fitzpatrick, a 2021 fourth-round pick at Louisville. Like, go get actual depth behind A.J. Brown and Julio Jones, and that doesn't even have to be with your high-end draft capital. That can be at the bottom of the barrel in free agency. You know who they... Uh, they would be a great, a great, who would be a great fit for them in the draft that I think would actually make an impact there that might not be a guy to make an impact everywhere. But Trey McBride, if he's there at the end of the second round for them, tied down at Colorado State, that's a guy I would love to add to this offense. I think these, what they could be, what they missed with not having John M. Smith. John M. Smith, not a big volume wide receiver, didn't put up a ton of yards in that offense, but versatile, good blocker, good on the move as a blocker, and a sure handed tight end, and also added some after the catch. That could be Trey McBride in your offense. I, I think that is someone who I would be targeting, like I said, in the back end of the second round, if he is there for the Tennessee Titans. I'm not sure there's really like one position I'm locked into otherwise, but you know, if you're the back end of the first round, they could also be in play for someone like a Zion Johnson mm-hmm. for, to really upgrade that offensive line as well. Yeah, upgrades along the offensive line is honestly where I'm looking with their top end draft capital. I'd rather have a lot of the offensive linemen ranked, you know, ahead, uh, even ahead of Trey McBride with their top end picks if they can swing it. But they, that's also a solution that they can have in free and see if they do move on from a Saffold, a Cunningham, Jenkins, et cetera, and open up some of the space to bring in some offensive linemen. Because, like, you look at some of the, you know, David Questenberry also expected to hit free agency. Ben Jones expected to hit free agency. Like, they have a lot of 
potential free agent losses along the offensive line and a lot of tight end losses too. Like you bring up Trey McBride, Swaim, Ferkser, and Nicole Pruitt are all unrestricted free agents entering this offseason. So they're going to have to make some decisions there as well. Defensively, I kind of love what they have in the secondary. You know, Janoris Jenkins, yeah, he could be cut and maybe you can find an upgrade there. But Christian Fulton, Amani Hooker, Elijah Molden, they have to hope Caleb Farley can get healthy. Love Kevin Byard, obviously. Along the defensive line, Danico Autry, I think, is one of the more underrated players in the NFL. We've already talked about Jeffrey Simmons. They could add some edge talent there. I don't think that's a draft decision, but more so a free agency decision, depending on who they can bring in to add depth and add more rotational depth there. But man, like I don't I don't hate where they're at in the secondary. And honestly, you could probably say that about what five teams in the NFL who actually have talent and depth in the secondary? They've drafted really well. And now uh, Caleb Farley wins TBD, but they've hit on a lot of those defensive players. Like I said, it's a very good young defense. On to Indianapolis Colts. Tie for seventh, according to DraftKings, to win the AFC next year. There are some reports that they could be moving on from Carson Wentz. I think it's likely that they move on from Carson Wentz. Their offseason resources rank, according to PFF, is 19th. Cap space right now, 37.4 mil. Needs in a lot of areas, in my opinion. And I think the biggest one being, how are they going to adjust for not having Eberflus? I think Eberflus was a big reason why this defense you know, exceeded expectations with the talent it had. Like We've talked about this defense a ton in season. It has talent but somewhat at low value positions. Like Darius Leonard is one of the best linebackers in the NFL, one of the best run defenders in the NFL, but plays inside linebacker. DeForest Buckner, interior defensive line, probably their best pass rusher, but again, not along the edge, not, not in an area where you're getting a ton of pressure. They need Quiddy Pay to step up there along the edge. That's a guy they obviously invested a first round pick in out of Michigan. But I think this Colts team has needs even beyond Carson Wentz if they do move on from him. I'm not sold on the Indianapolis Colts losing Uber Flus and potentially losing others as this contender in the AFC South. Yeah, th this they're in a bad way to a degree because of the Carson Wentz deal. Now, they can get out from under it if they really want to. And like if someone wants to trade for him, they can easily move on. But again, you, it costs you your first round pick this year. He is your biggest cap hit next year at 28 million against and you still don't really know what you're going to get out of him and I think while, you know, after the season Chris Ballard's like basically said that we're not necessarily committed to him and that it probably was a mistake to go back and do it. Obviously, it didn't work out. They didn't even make playoffs. I think they're going to end up rolling with him another year just because the options are going to be so limited. Yeah, You're obviously not going to get one in the draft. And they've really done well to manage their cap and don't have – like they have $37 million cap space as one of – a team that people were talking about is Dark Horse Super Bowl. Like they were right in the mix there last year. They're not too far away. If I'm going to, so the moves I would make for them, I would spend a little cash this offseason. I know it's not really their MO. They're the kings of the mid range free agent deals, if anything. They've rarely made the splash play like DeForest Buckner, one of the few. But I think at wide receiver, I'd be willing to outlay some cash for them. And I'd probably go to the edge and try to find a pass rusher, a veteran pass rusher in the mix for one of those, know, like Von Miller, whoever, that could that you just know you can rely on to Chandler get some pressure Jones. across from, yes, across from Quiddipay. Because that, to me, is the two areas where they just are not good enough right now. It's wide receiver outside of Michael Pittman and your edge even with Quiddy Pay last year, it just was not good enough. Actively, actively in the Von Miller, Chandler Jones, potentially even Randy Gregory, Melvin Ingram yeah. market. Right? Hell, if they if the Tennessee Titans let Harold Landry go, put in a word for Harold Landry, who's expected to test for A and see if he is not re-signed by the Tennessee Titans. They need help there. No longer can you keep drafting there. Kamoko Ture, the former 2018 second round pick, he's on his way out. Ben Banagu, the 2019 second round pick, has not played up to expectation. And Quiddy Pay, even though you still have obviously opportunity for him to develop in year two, he's still a very young player. Like you need production now. This Colts window, regardless of whether you like it or not was opened up and confirmed when you made these fucking this trade for Carson Wentz. And if you're not going to cut him and commit to like an all-out rebuild, 
then you're probably going to need to make some short move decisions, short term decisions like adding a Chandler Jones or a Von Miller or a Randy Gregory, are these pass rushers to help with Quiddy Pay's development. And even on the back end too, I think they need help at corner, right? Like I don't think you can continue to trot out Xavier Rhodes. <laughs> I, I think you need to go get another outside corner and maybe even some safety help as well. Like this team needs more than maybe its record or even its like market expectation right now tied for seventh to win the AFC um, is, is kind of letting on. On to the Jacksonville Jaguars. 14th in odds to win the AFC. Not surprising. I did talk to Eric Eager, however, and he mentioned them as a potential dark horse to win the AFC if you're looking for long odds. You know, Urban Meyer maybe put too much of a black eye on this situation in Jacksonville and maybe a new head coach coming in could help them out. Maybe Doug Peterson's the right, the future and Trevor Lawrence lives up to expectation, but they also have a ton of offseason resources, right? Second in the NFL in available resources. A lot of that stemming from obviously having the number one overall pick in addition to having $59.2 million in cap space. Like they can go put a ton around Trevor Lawrence. They can go out and add a receiver in free agency and in the draft. They can add offensive line help. They can add a tight end, which they don't currently have right now. That is where my mindset goes. And you have here in your move to make give Trevor everything he needs. That should be on everyone's list. If you are creating offseason content around the Jacksonville Jaguars, it is you should spend every dollar and every draft pick on propping up Trevor Lawrence and putting him in a position to succeed just as other successful franchises have done with young quarterbacks what the Bengals did with Joe Burrow what the Bills did with Josh Allen you need to do this if you're going to um actually develop Trevor Lawrence and 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 put yourself in this window of winning with Trevor Lawrence while he's on a rookie contract yeah I if I'm Trent Baalke or whoever's gonna be making decisions for the Jaguars here uh come free agency time I am looking at what the Bills did in 2019 Josh Allen's second year and trying to create a carbon copy of that because that offseason they went out and signed John Brown, Cole Beasley, wide receivers, both those guys, Ty and Secchi at offensive tackle, Frank Gore at running back. Don't go sign Frank Gore, but you get the point. Tyler Croft at tight end, Mitch Morse at center. They went out and laid a bunch of money to get a bunch of guys to just raise the floor, basically, to, to not be horseshit like you were last year. That's what you have to do for Jacksonville. And, and again, Spend it wisely. Don't go give Rayshon Jenkins almost a $10 million cap at this year. Roy Robertson Harris is going to count $9 million against the cap this year. That's absurd. Go out and pay like guys you know are actually good at football, please, to help out. And again, now on the defense side of the ball, do not spend that money on the defense side of the ball. Spend it all on offense because that is where you're going to win games if you're going to win any this year. Yeah, and I think once you... Pretty you know, easy blueprint. Once you do follow that first step in the blueprint, which is filling the glaring, glaring holes on offense and see Trevor Lawrence have success, right? Because if you do that well, and Trevor Lawrence lives up to the expectation that people had going into this that last season, it's you're going to come out of it and you're going to say, okay, now we can add to this defense and now we actually have something that's competent and they consistently compete deep in the postseason. Are you in on them going after? I know you mentioned Allen Robinson as a potential fit because he's coming back home to Jacksonville. That's what the Jaguars mm -hmm. need. Are you adding one receiver in free agency, two receivers in free agency? I'm not I'm not sold that they shouldn't double dip at that position. Well, I think they'll be in a good spot at the top of the second round to grab a guy in free agent or in, in the draft because that's been a hot spot for what or that's been a lot of wide receivers. It's Debo Samuel, T Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr., Elijah Moore. Every year there's a guy at the top of the second round that's like, "Yep, Still a good wide receiver. So that's where I think you go if you are the Jacksonville Jaguars. If a trade down is not lucrative in return. Because, again, and I, and I say invest this money in the offensive side of the ball in terms of free agency. Because you've invested a lot defensively in the draft. Whether it's Tyson Campbell at the top of the second last year. Whether it's uh, two first rounders on the defense side of the ball the year before that. And CJ Henderson and Caleb on chase. Know, it's Josh Allen the year before that like you invested a lot of draft cap on the defense side of the ball shit turn that around and give trevor lawrence some help for once last but not least in the afc south houston texans currently ranked 15th in odds to win the afc next year a lot of question marks around deshaun watson he was trending today there was a report that i think came from espn saying the bucks and the vikings could be landing spots for Deshaun Watson. This is a tough situation to speak to, in my opinion. I think the way he's been referred to, even in that article, was 
serial allegations of sexual assault against Deshaun Watson. And it's almost like every piece of content you're creating around Deshaun Watson, even speaking to him, you're like, this aside, he goes to the box, he can win a you know, it's like I, I do think it's become I, we've like talked about it. Yeah, though, you know? it, it, like, it, it's it's become a it's tired like, conversation involving Deshaun Watson. Do you Watson want me to say game. sexual assault's wrong? Sexual assault sucks. Don't ever do it. It is a horrible thing. Should he be in jail if their allegations are true? Yeah, probably. Are we ever going to be able to prove them? Doesn't seem like it. That's why they're not pressing any charges currently. So, shit. Who knows what happens with Deshaun Watson? Regardless, I don't think he plays another snap for the Houston Texans. We can move on pretty accordingly there. Their offseason resources rank is ninth. Cap space at 17.6 million. Needs everywhere. Literally everywhere. If you go to PFS Mock Draft Simulator, the needs list says every position. And I don't think it's wrong. There is a lot of need for this roster. It was the roster that was favored to lose the most games last year. They lucked into some games and are picking number three overall in the draft. But it is one of the worst rosters in the NFL, especially, obviously, with Deshaun Watson not playing for this team. Yeah, and the moves to make, you have to trade him. Like, I can't not believe they didn't just sat him on the bench for 16 games last year, paying him, mind you, absurdly, to just do nothing. Weirdest, one of the weirdest sort of... And like it, it stopped like every week they had to list him as an inactive, you know, like how just a, a purely absurd scene to happen on a football field, uh, at least in my lifetime. And you just, as a franchise, as a fan, you're not going to last much longer. Like with that guy, the roster, like looking your fan base in the face and saying, we're just going to let him cash checks, like do something about it, trade the guy. Trade Laramie Tunsil, trade Brandon Cooks. You're at this crux as a roster where you're awful. Legitimately one of the worst rosters in the NFL. And they tried to smooth it out with the zillion veterans in free agency last year or for like all minimum deals. And got yourself to the third overall pick. Woohoo. Awesome. Just let her realize, let her marinate a little that you're poop. Like get rid of everything you can to get draft capital back because you are not good. And it's we said last year going into that this was the worst data I've seen any franchise in modern NFL history. They, they were just, it was a three year minimum turnaround at that point. But that starts with getting back draft capital. It starts with trading Sean Watson. It starts with trading Larry Tunsil. It starts with trading every competent piece that someone will give you anything for on that roster because they're not doing anything for you going out there and sadly losing. 14 plus games next year. If anything, they're doing less. I mean, it's it just can't be yeah. a positive. Like, you saw, like you're cutting half these guys. Whitney Merciless, like you're cutting them mid-season because there are cancers in your locker room because they don't want to be there. They don't want to be on a team that's that bad. So get young guys in the building. Guys trying to prove themselves instead of a bunch of veterans. Get young guys trying to prove themselves who will then compete and get better and actually maybe build a culture there. They should be able to recruit the state of Illinois better though having Lovey Smith there. I don't know how much recruiting matters. Yeah, I but... mean his uh, coach Nate Hobbs from the Raiders. Maybe he wants to be there. Lovey Smith. You don't know that. You don't know that. But no, I agree. The I think only Illinois player in the NFL. Worth the the right Houston now. Texans. You know, I, I think I've mentioned this phrase a lot and probably have used it too many times. But thinking about the Houston Texans' shortest path to a Super Bowl, it is uprooting the hell out of this roster and completely resetting with new young talent because the veterans that you have now with your current quarterback situation won't be winning anything for you. Yeah, Larry Tunsil has two more years on yeah, Far beyond his, like, yeah, far beyond his current contract. So That's I it. think moving on from Tunsil, <laughs> moving on from Cooks, doing whatever you need to do with Deshaun Watson so he's not even brought up in the city of Houston anymore is, is your best next step forward. Um, you can talk about some of the free agents that they should target. It's anyone and everyone willing to come play you know, that are obviously competent players, like going and getting competent players, not breaking the bank in free agency necessarily because you're not in that window yet, but still adding talent where you can with players that obviously want to come and play Houston and be a part of a rebuild. Like that is the pitch, right? Lovey Smith is going into these things, talking to agents, talking to agents and saying, hey, we want to sign this guy. We have this much money. It's going to be more than the Packers offered you because you, to come here, you're going to need to be a part of like a two, three year, year rebuild. There will be players who will take less money to play elsewhere, period. Yeah. And you have to deal with that. I, I mean, all rebuilding teams do. And then getting through this period and getting to the next phase of a rebuild where you can sign guys in a window is, is getting this quarterback, whether you find him in the draft, wherever you go, and then continuing to add talent, young talent through the draft.
Before we get to Bucks, Saints, Panthers, the NFC South, got to shout out some more proud sponsors of the Tailgate Podcast. Western Southern, the Tailgate Podcast is sponsored by Western Southern Financial Group. While you focus on your roster moves, Western Southern helps advance your money moves, buying your first home, planning to start a family, wondering how to make your money grow. Western Southern's playbook of life insurance, investment, and retirement solutions helps you rest assured on game day. Team up to understand needs and address goals with a game plan built just for you. Get started at westernsouthern.com slash PFF. The other sponsor I will shout out is PFF itself. You can get 25% off any PFF subscription right after you get done signing up for life insurance with Western Southern using promo code tailgate, T-A-I-L-G-A-T-E. Support the podcast. Use that promo code. That helps put, you know, that helps us pay for the flat that we have, the apartment. If you want us to put rent together, subscribe to PFF. I would not refer PFF. to it as a flat. I'm not, a, I'm not British. I kind of like referring to it as a flat. Have we told people about the four TV setup? We did, yeah. Okay. Well, I'm just hammering home. It's going to be sick. I'm excited for the four TV setup. We got to get a picture out on tailgate when it comes up. All right. Bucks. Bucks, despite Tom Brady's retirement, have the fifth best odds to win the NFC next year. That's an absurd bet to make with Kyle Trask. That's an absurd bet to make. They also rank 24th in offseason resources, only $3.1 million in cap space, and could lose, in addition to Tom Brady, because all these guys are free agents, Rob Gronkowski, Leonard Fournette, Carlton Davis, Jordan Whitehead, Chris Godwin, Ryan Jensen, and Alex Kappa. Yeah. This team is going to need to do some wild, wild cap wizardry to retain a lot of those guys, and they don't have an answer at quarterback. Kyle, Kyle, Kyle Trask could be good, but he's not going to be the answer in year one. Well, that's the thing. This is this is one of those odds where it's like, it's not actually, that's not actually the odd. You know, like, how am I trying to describe this? I don't know. It's, it's either a lot higher than that if they go, if Tom Brady unretires, they trade for a quarterback, say Deshaun So they're Watson. baking in some unretirement yes. here. They they do that, they're first or second. They don't do that, they're twelfth, thirteenth, fourteenth. Like realistically, they roll in with Kyle Trask. It's way lower than that. So they're baking in that uncertainty of a big move being made. But yeah, they're kind of up against it. And this was this was they knew this. You know, they knew that this was kind of I don't want to say the last ride, but they did everything. They did what would be called poor roster management if you were. Let's say the, I don't know, Las Vegas Raiders. You're an average team in the NFL. That would have been, they made poor decisions with their money last year, but it was to try to win in 2021. Um, and, and they so almost did. Kind of, yeah, and they, they were very close. Like they, it, when you get to that point, it's tough. You, know, you have to be, even the most dominant NFL team in my lifetime did not win a Super Bowl. That's how difficult it is to win a Super Bowl. So getting there. Who was that? The 2002 Raiders? No, it's 2007 Patriots. I know. Joke. I'm just kidding, okay. dude. Come on. Just make sure. Sometimes I can't tell. The only team that's undefeated ever going into a Super Bowl. Oh, you mean that one? <laughs> um, but so so they kind of have kind of coming back to roost, but they're still a good roster. Like even if they lose, say Chris Godwin and Fringe, even if they lose Ryan Jensen, Alex Kappa, those aren't massive, massive losses. But again, it's the Tom Brady thing. Like that, replacing him is where. It starts to get hairy because there were people at PFF to call him the MVP this past year. I didn't agree with that, obviously. But Steve sure, Palazzolo wrote a whole fucking article about it. So go read that if you really think want to know how good he Tom got Brady a vote was. for MVP. He did more one more than Russell Wilson's ever gotten. But I, so I, I'm not sure there's a real great path to success. But I don't think you kick the can anymore. Like you don't say let's run it, like let's do whatever we can to get Godwin back in the yeah, fold. Yeah, yeah. Get, all these guys back in the fold. The one guy I would try to keep in the fold is Carlton Davis because love cornerbacks. That the thing that separates the Bucks is kind of that that cornerback, that three headed monster that they can throw out when all those guys are healthy and their ability to go three abreast at the cornerback position better than probably anyone else in the NFC right now. So that's your market differentiator so that's the guy i'm prioritizing in free agency to keep after that you beg tom to come back you trade for a quarterback if not you kind of just put your tail between your legs and say this is why we draft kyle trask yeah this will not be an off season led by the slogan run it back right remember last year even at the parade they're like we're running it back and they were able to re-sign gronk they were able to re-sign leonard fournette shaquille barrett levante david got chris godwin back on a one-year deal this year 
they don't have that pitch, right? Tom Brady's not in that locker room to say, like, hey, come back and we can win another. It's like, no. If you're coming back, you're going to be part of somewhat of a rebuild, right? Like somewhat of a rebuild with a new young quarterback, an unproven quarterback. It's not necessarily a rebuild from a roster perspective, but like your odds to win in the postseason. Yeah. You did, if they're not you, you low, not become, there's a fat question mark. You did not become the destination that's going to get an Antonio Brown, that's going to get a Richard Sherman, mm-hmm. whoever that may be this upcoming offseason or into the next season. It's going to be somewhere else this year. Saints, eighth ranked odds to win the NFC. They have negative $75.9 million in cap space. Now, they're still not last in offseason resources rank because we factor in movable cap space, void years, all that stuff, yeah. all that wizardry the New Orleans Saints front office has put in. So they're 23rd in offseason resources. They can make cuts. Malcolm Jenkins, Bradley Roby would save them money. And obviously there's a lot of like what they can do with the void years with Taysom Hill and those things that can help mm-hmm. them get under the cap. They will get under the cap before next season. It's just going to take some more, obviously, we keep calling it wizardry, but more moves from yeah. the front office to make some plays there. Yeah, they, I think their best bet, and like they can keep everyone. I think they can even re sign Marcus Williams. I don't think they're going to go out and be major players in free agency, but they could even do some hole plugging in that regard at whatever position they feel needs plugged. The, the elephant in the room, though, is Taysom Hill is your quarterback. <laughs> Taysom Hill is your only quarterback under contract. Um, obviously, uh, Ian Book, too, excuse me. Um, but Taysom Hill is who's penciled in to be your starter right now. I, I think what I would do if I was them, I would take Jameis back. You're, you're, I don't think he'll be that cheap or as cheap as he was last year, but I don't think he'll be super expensive either. And I might even draft a quarterback as well, but I, I don't think that all is lost here by any means. I, I think the Saints honestly have the best chance of any of these teams going in right now to win the South. If I had to bet any, on any of these teams right now, it would be the New Orleans Saints to win the South because they're going to keep a lot intact. The one kind of odd contract on the books right now is Michael Thomas. Uh, He's 29 years old, set to have a cap hit of 25 million this upcoming year, and it's only going to be 25 million the next three years. That's a big number. And as good as Michael Thomas is, he's good at certain things that mesh well with Drew Brees that don't necessarily dress mesh well with James Winston as much. Basically, underneath route tree, getting open on slants is the obvious slant boy moniker. But like out routes, is option slant routes, boy? he's he's very good at getting. And he's good at that. Like that's why he runs a lot of them because he can do that. And Drew Brees is very accurate on those routes, and he moved a lot of chains over the years. But twenty five million dollars for that guy when Jameis Winston wants to attack down the football field could be spent better. So I, I do wonder if he will be. And obviously, there's a rift between, or has been. You know, he's the he's the subtweet king on twitter that there's this obvious sort of animosity ish between him and the organization that could be a guy that if you can get some resources back for him that i would be debating trading this offseason yeah i think if his contract is movable yeah, so too, which i think it's so. which it is banked yeah. in i think i think his contract is movable via trade i think michael thomas will be on the block as he's kind of been rumored over the last like, year plus i don't know how much of that rift is there still with the front office obviously it's going to be a new not an entirely new coaching staff, but a new regime with yeah. uh, Dennis Allen taking over for Sean Payton as head coach. I, I view this team as not one that's going to be in the veteran. Do you, do you honestly think they're going to be in the veteran quarterback market, or are they just going to try and run it back with James Winston? I mean, I don't think they're going to be in the. Uh, I was you know, why is Aaron Rodgers the only name that comes to mind? But uh, Aaron Rodgers, Kirk Cousins, you know, yeah, the guys who could be on the market because that's going to cost them. I just don't think they can get to that price point mm-hmm. because there's no trading then renegotiating. Like you, you, you trade them and that's kind of the number you're getting. So I, I just I don't think they can do that much cap magic. This is this. this is a draft in Jameis year. Jameis the starter, Desmond Ritter. Maybe you get at 18 or the quarterback that you like at that do. position and. Do what you can to move on from some of these bloated contracts, right? Mm-hmm. It's not a team that's competing for a Super Bowl with even a combination of, of Jameis Winston and, and Desmond Ritter, but it is a team that needs to start to desperately you know, make some moves in the direction of getting under less cap hell and, and, I, and, and being more competitive. I could see Jameis being in demand this offseason, though, more so than last offseason, even despite the ACL, because the, the need just amplified. Mm-hmm. You know, Roethlisberger retiring, Brady retiring. Darnold being poop, like 
a lot of quarterbacks kind of fell out of the I mean just a lot of quarterbacks that were penciled in as day one you know the week one obvious starters last year are now not there and you're not replenishing it with a quarterback class in Mm -hmm. 2022 and if the Buccaneers right now start Kyle Trask all next season Panthers are starting Darnold and the Falcons are starting Ryan like it's not a division it's it's a division they could win with James it's a division that they could win that's what I said I said I like them best James all right Let's get to the Carolina Panthers. Obviously, so much of the conversation with Carolina Panthers is going to be around what they do with Sam Darnold, and there's not much they can do, right, with the investments they made. But still, offseason resources rank after trading for Sam Darnold, 29th in offseason resources rank, only $16.6 million in available cap space right now. There aren't a lot of cuts that they can make to move some cap space around either. Some notable free agents, Stefan Gilmore, Hassan Reddick, Jermaine Carter, Dante Jackson, they could lose a lot as well. Panthers, man, down bad is how I how I look at this team. They are not in a position to compete in the NFC South, especially with the quarterback play that they've had. And there's not a lot of answers, right? Like they can't, you know, they can't. They're in a similar situation that the Colts are, and that they've you've made this decision for the quarterback, right? You've traded these picks for Sam Darnold. You traded these picks for Carson Wentz. You kind of have to, you know, reap what you sow at this point. Yeah, and this this is a this is a really good. What you said there about their offseason resource rank being 29th, yet they have $16.6 million cap space. Really shows how offseason resources takes into account uh, sort of being able to create cap space. Because they have $16.6 million, and there's not really anyone they can cut or part ways with or do anything to to create more cap space. So that's kind of like it. $16.6 million. And they got guys who are hitting free agency like Dante Jackson, like Hassan Reddick, like Stefan Gilmore, that you might want back on this team. There were some of those guys, big contributors in 2021. So they're kind of screwed. It's kind of, there, there's no real sugarcoat in it. The Panthers are in a tough spot in terms of adding new talent. That's why the move I would make if I were them is to invest heavily in a time machine because you fucked up last offseason. You straight up did. Wow. I mean, you did. And you know it now, but there's no, but it's a, it was a decision that is going to screw you now for two straight seasons. And yes, yeah, Sam Darnold could be good, and that's that's your prey. That's what you're praying right now. But I think the other route I would take is to try to trade back in the draft. You have a six overall pick in the draft. Try to get any draft capital you can get because obviously you flipped some picks for Sam Darnold. I believe they're second or third this upcoming season. So you got your first, and then you don't have any until the fourth. You need more than that to pump up this roster to help rebuild this offensive line. Trade back. I would love to still get a QB there, but trade back, maybe draft offensive line as well, and pray, pray that Sam Donald does anything, uh, and then address it after that contract's off the books next year. They need multiple time machines. I don't even know how it works, but... The decision, their Teddy Bridgewater decision was bad, and then the do, double down on that. To the Sam Darnold decision was bad. They, they, and then the decision to pass on Justin Fields, I will still argue again, was bad. Even with as good, pretend J.C. Horn becomes the best quarterback or best defensive player out of that draft, you are in a rough spot to win the division, win the conference because you don't have an answer at quarterback, and you instead have a bunch of. You know, you're, 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 people are making jokes about your offseason needs and people are calling for time machines and those things. Like it, it is, it's absurd to me the decisions they've people made. People are calling for time machines. You are I calling for I think I'm the machines. only one calling for no, time No, I think that, that might catch on. I think that could catch on. I, I'm like physically upset at the decisions they've made, specifically at quarterback. Yeah. Like when they signed Teddy Bridgewater to that three year contract, that was absurd. That they were not ready to compete with Teddy Bridgewater. And then when they move on from Teddy Bridgewater and trade a second round pick for the opportunity to pay Sam Darnold twenty million dollars on his fifth year option, that like turned what we thought was a bad quarterback decision to somehow worse. And guess what? Well, well, Their roster is still like young and developing. And I think there's a lot of pieces there to like, but it's not good enough to win anywhere. It's not good enough to win with Sam Darnold. It's not good enough to win with Teddy Bridgewater. And they didn't even make a decision to bring in one of the top five quarterbacks from last year's class. So they're on the outside looking in again. To go back to the Darnold thing, and like irrespective of how good Darnold was or how good you thought Darnold would be, the problem with it, the reason we had such a problem with it, is they had the eighth overall pick last year's draft. They, in a quarterback heavy draft that, the offensive rookie of the year fell to 15. That had five he guys in it last year. Exactly. Five guys. Offensive rookie of the year is Jamar Chase. Oh, so, okay. the, but, the, the second ranked offensive rookie of the year. But there was a golden opportunity for you to 
go young at the position, go cheap at the position, and shoot the moon. Like, really have a chance to go to Super Bowls should you hit there. Because then you'll have a lot of cap space. You'll be paying a cheap quarterback. You won't be paying Sam Darnold $18 million like you are this year. You'll be paying that guy $6, 7000000 million. You have an eighth overall pick and really make a big splash and then have your draft picks this year still. Um, that's why we were so critical of that decision last year. And well, I would love to hear, I would CBD. love to hear what the thought process was when they made the decision to trade for Sam Darnold. Did they at that point, when they still had the number eight overall pick, did they at that point think Mac Jones was not going to be available at eight? There was a lot of smoke that he was going to be selected at number three overall by the Niners. Did they not think Fields would be available? Or here's the worst situation. And these are the conversations I'd have if I owned this team. Did you not think Fields was a better prospect to play in the NFL than Darnold? And if you're like, no, we like Darnold more than Fields, then it's just fire the entire fucking organization. Because well, if you were no, in that position... No, no, I mean, like, prospect coming out, I can see Sam Darnold being a better No, prospect. same. Okay, yeah. but that's not what they were dealing with. They were dealing well, with... That's how you phrased it, sorry. So, I wasn't trying to phrase it that way. What I was phrasing was, is do you like Sam Darnold for a second-round pick and the opportunity to pay him a fifth-year option more than drafting Justin Fields at eight? And if the answer was yes to that question, I would highly question their roster building abilities. Now, if they thought, no, we got sources, there's just no way Fields is falling to us at eight. That's why we have to make a decision now. We're going to be on the outside looking in. Mac Jones will be gone. Trey Lance will be gone. Fields will be gone. We should get our quarterback now. If that's what they thought, one, you got to question those sources. But if they actually thought a better decision was to make that trade for Sam Darnold and extend him on that fifth-year option, then to swing the bat on Justin Fields at eight overall, I, I, I question their evaluation of the position. I question, I question that decision significantly. Any other decisions for the Panthers outside of a time machine? No, nah, that's tough. I just got to pray. Got to pray. Falcons, last team here on the AFC and NFC South offseason previews. Resources rank at 18th. DraftKings gives them the tie for 12th best odds to win the NFC. Cap space at minus 6.6 .6 million. Biggest needs, cornerback, safety, quarterback, wide receiver, linebacker. They got the needs. They got needs everywhere. Falcons don't have a good roster. They're literally last place in odds to win the NFC in what is already a pretty bad division. Um, can they trade Matt Ryan? I don't understand his contract situation. They like dumped a lot of money into this year. And it, it is like, that was something that I was talking to Brad Spielberger about, who's a cap analyst here at PFF. And there, I don't know if I got a clear answer from him, but like, what is the deal with his contract? So he yeah, has cap hits of $48 million this year, $43 million next year. Should they trade him? It'll be a cap hit of $40 million this year. And I believe something like $10 million next year. That'll be on their books. Like so, they have to pay that. Yes. Like so, you're still you're still gonna be a lot of dead money should you trade them. It'll be I think the most dead money in a contract in NFL history probably. Forty point five million but, but, dollars. But you still save him. against the cap this year. You you it is a big cap savings to do so because if you place for you it's forty eight million dollars. So like mm -hmm. you're splitting hairs. You can put yourself in. The, you made your bed. Now you gotta sleep in it or buy new covers. Um, if that analogy made. Any I sense. don't think it did. Didn't think it landed. But. I'm of the opinion you got to trade him. You're, you're just look up and down this roster. You need completely new, almost completely new offensive and defensive lines. Grady Jarrett, one of your best players, is on a who took a hard downturn last year and is even a guy who I highlighted here as a possible cap casualty because he's due for $23.8 million this upcoming season. You could save $17 million by cutting him. So, you're in a bad way. You were 7-10 and 10 last year. That looks all right on paper, but you had a worse point differential than the Detroit Lions. Yikes. You're objectively... Say that again you, for the people in the back. My God. They were a bad team. They are flat out a bad team last year. Um, and yeah, you have a top 10 pick. Yeah, you, you can make some shrewd decisions, get back in. And, and yeah, you love Matt Ryan, lifelong Falcon, done a lot, won an MVP there. Great player. You love for him to retire as Falcon and get back into contending. But... By the time you could realistically build up this roster, again, with their cap space, not being able to sign free agents this offseason, not being in a position to really add um, more than you're just, you know, number eight overall pick in the draft. Realistically, you're two to three years away. He's two to three years away from retiring, two years away from having to have a new contract. So at that point, though, at 37 years old, Matt Ryan can fetch you something still because, like we've talked about a bunch, 
I think I've highlighted like six teams now that should trade for quarterbacks. Yeah. That should and be Matt the market. Ryan's trade market also factors in that they don't have to pay him that 40 exactly, mil. Exactly, exactly. Like His 40. number for you, if you're trading for Matt Ryan, will be a lot lower. Yes. So he could command first-round pick easily this year, more probably than just a first-round pick, despite his age, despite the fact that there might not be too much left in the tank there. At that point, if you're the Atlanta Falcons... And at that point, too, the, the, the Falcons... I'm sorry to cut you off, but like the Falcons getting... Say they got a first-round pick in change for Matt Ryan, which a lot of people, I think, would be surprised by, but you're getting capital in exchange for dead cap space at that point. Because like everyone would be like, oh my God, they're going to eat $40 million in dead cap space to watch Matt Ryan play for another team. Yeah, they're going to do it, and they're going to get a first and a second round pick in return for it. Yeah. Rather than paying him $48 million this year to start him for 17 games and watch him win seven of them. Yeah. It's And it goes back to, uh, there were people actually on the YouTube commenting about the Jared Goff thing, being like, why would you eat $30 million in dead cap space to cut Goff? It's because you're paying him $30 million to play or paying him $30 million not to play. It's that... It's $30 million this year in dead cap space, but then nothing for the future. Yeah. Whereas if you just let Matt Ryan go through this year and then maybe move him next year, because let's face it, it's not going to be like it's going to be an overnight change here happening in Atlanta with whatever moves they're going to make this offseason. There's no quick fix to get this roster back to competing. And at that point, $43 million next year. All of a sudden, you're cutting him. You're still you're eating you know, $15, $20 million next year should you move on from him, trade him then. So... It's taking that hit now when you know you're not going to be good to have that money to play with when you could be good. So that's kind of how I feel. And I'd also be – I don't know Calvin Ridley's behind-the-scenes situation with the organization. Obviously, he took time off last year to deal with mental health issues. But that's one where I would also consider either extending him or trading him right now because, again, that's a guy who is going to hit the free agent market in 2023. I think going into this conversation – TBD. Going into this conversation, I felt that I would be totally against trading Matt Ryan, knowing that they'd have to take on $40 million in dead cap. But the more I think about it, and the more you compare it to the Jared Goff situation... Well, I mean, it's the Carson Wentz. It's more comparable probably the Carson Wentz situation, where it's like, you know it's not going to happen. You know he has value, that you can get something in return. Mm -hmm. Do it. Like, eat it now, when you know it's going to be a tough year. And shit the... Eagles made the playoffs. But, I mean, the Carson you know? Wentz situation is different, though, because yeah. if they trade him, they don't take on any dead cap. They trade him, and someone else takes on his entire salary. For who? If Carson Wentz is traded. No, back when he was traded with the Eagles. Oh, oh so okay, I got, I got you. I got when you. When they took, that was the record. That, that was the most dead cap ever taken in a season, was when they traded Carson Wentz. Mm-hmm. The over $30 million last year. But that's just the way of the world with quarterbacks nowadays. When you know he's not going to be the guy for you, better to move on as soon as possible and not just... Yeah. Play nice because he's a franchise legend. I think you have to you have to look at it less on because I think when you frame the conversation of oh you're going to pay him X amount of money to not play for you, there is this immediate connotation of like wow we got to keep him you know like same with like Jared Goff sunk cost fallacy yeah yeah exactly sunk it's cost a, it's the sunk cost we've we've had this conversation before but same with Jared Goff it's like well, we're paying him thirty million dollars we might as well get some juice out of him it's like what is that juice that juice is going to be three or four wins right like it's not going to be a- that's like a ten percent juice OJ that's a high C <laughs> that's not great I think and then for Matt Ryan right like. You bring Matt Ryan back, you pay him $48 million, the 40 you'd pay him no matter what, and the $8 million you're only paying him because he's playing for you to win seven, eight games. You know, they're not competing for an NFC South title. They're not competing for a deep postseason run. Yeah. At that point... Well, shit, I mean, the NFC South kind of went south into quickly. Wow. South into quickly, south quickly. So they could... I mean, like, lightning in a bottle, this team could win the NFC South. I know they have the worst odds, but no one's really world beaters at this point. That being said... You, you, you set your set your sights you set your sights higher than that as a franchise than just eking out a, a nine and eight franchise uh, division title. No, no, I think that's fair. I think I'm on board. I'm on board with trading Matt Ryan and eating the forty mil. That's going to do it for the off season game plans. We're, we're throwing out some bold takes here. Throwing out some bold takes. Now let's get to Gator Mail. That's right. I'm committing to the name. People don't like it. It's not good enough. I'm fine with it. Gator Mail. It is. Got Gators living, delivering speak pipe voicemails or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts with a question in there. Quinn, we're ready, if you're ready, to rip up some Gator voicemails if you have them. Yep, let's do it. This first one is uh, from Austin's dad's BAC. Yikes. This better be good. Hey, guys. 
The Eagles haven't drafted a linebacker in the first two rounds since 2012, uh, coincidentally, nearly five years to the date before my wife left me, um, which had me thinking, do positional value considerations change if you're on offense or defense? On offense, you're in an attacking role. So if you don't have something like a running back or tight end, you can just not target or center your offense around that. On defense, um, you're more like Austin's mom in the passive receiver role. Uh, you kind of have to react to whatever the <laughs> offense gives you. So if you're missing a linebacker um, or missing even a box safety, the offense can attack that. So I guess my question is, <laughs> is it more necessary to fill out every position on defense, even in a low positional value position like linebacker, uh, as opposed to offense? I'm just thinking – Missing a spot on defense could be a bigger block on your defense than Renner's after a breakup. That guy did well. See that, that was awesome. That was from Austin's dad, yeah. BAC. I liked the intermix jokes there. That was a good joke cadence to actual question cadence. I am with him in that defense. I'm not saying you have you you just need eliteness on offense and not completeness, but like, I think defense, it leans that way where it's more of a weak link side of the football compared to offense where offense you need like we've said multiple playmakers defense it's like depth can't have any weak links not going to say the word that we're going to say tomato cans i might say it again and then you can't like defense i do think that it's more important to have what completeness on that side than it is on offense but also i will also say there's like it's less valuable but linebackers nowhere it's linebackers more like tight end where like Travis Kelsey is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. George Kittle extremely valuable. Mark Andrews extremely valuable. Like those guys who are good at it are extremely valuable. Um, it's not as valuable as cornerback or safety, but I, I wouldn't compare it to like running back. Where again, you completely ignore that. Running back's more like defensive tackle and like its value that it really only impacts like one facet of the game. Whereas linebackers can be versatile, can impact multiple facets of the game. And the ones that are game changers are game changers. Are yeah. very like Darius Leonard, Fred Warner. Those guys make a massive impact. Uh, I do just think that it's it is just slightly below, like in ours, you know, edge corner, um, in terms of value. But it's not it's not close to sort of the value gap that running back is offensively. But I, I get what because of what you said because you're not because you still are you're not dictating terms. You are you have to react. And if you have a shitty linebacker, he can be targeted every single time if you want to. Because mm -hmm. I get what he's saying in that. You know, because it is reactive, there's less of a need to have like weapons, right? Like you don't need like you don't need wet. Obviously, it's great to have weapons on defense. Like Earl Thomas was a weapon on defense. What you really need though is no like no obvious obvious weak links, right? You have obvious obvious weak links, then they're going to use their weapons to destroy you. Like it miss, it's a mismatch game. You hear Mike McDaniel in those press conferences saying, "What we're going to do every single week is identify where you're weakest, and we're going to exploit it every single time." It doesn't matter if you have an entire secondary of Jalen Ramsey's. If your linebacker is like me out there, they're just going to just take him down. Like that's what that's how offenses work. Uh, next, speak pipe or. Remember, this, yeah, yeah, this one is from Dom C, who I think has called in before. Dom C. All right, boys, your self-proclaimed number one British listener is back with another yep, question. Him. But before I do, Austin, mate, we've got to talk about your TikTok. To have director of content at PFF putting out content of that quality on the app is oh, honestly no. a sackable offense. <laughs> Let me give you some friendly advice, free of charge. Ditch the recycled Twitter and podcast content. We love it, but we've seen it already. Fair. Show us something new, maybe some top 10 lists, specific player breakdowns, uh, player profiles, anything, anything else. And please, for the love of God, make the video vertical. Now on to my actual question. There are quarterbacks who in very specific circumstances that to become absolutely 100% elite. So which of the following quarterbacks would you rather have for playing at this specific level of eliteness for your team for a whole season? So number one, is Ryan Fitzpatrick before he is named a starter. Number two is Kirk Cousins in that one random 1 p.m. game in the middle of the season against the below 500 team. And option three is the first four games of the season, Russell Wilson. Cheers. I think Kirk Cousins is the one o'clock slate. Like Kirk Cousins against, it doesn't even have to be like the Detroit Lions or the Houston Texans, but like Kirk Cousins against the Falcons, one o'clock slate in the Metrodome. Find me a quarterback that beats him. You won't. The Metrodome. What Wait, not this? the Metrodome. 
Wait, what is the Vikings Dome called? I think it's U.S. Bank. U.S. Bank Arena, whatever it is. But in the Dome, in the Minnesota Stadium, I don't know what it's called. I'm going to look it up. But I think Kirk Cousins is the quarterback I take there. I'm taking Fitzpatrick before. Stop! Fitzpatrick had a two-game stretch start of the 2018 season? 19? One of those years. Where the game against the Saints was like an, literally an all-time performance where he outdueled Drew Brees. Um, yeah, Fitzpatrick. Oh, I remember that, like, that one actually. In that gray area of he just came in off the bench, has no clue, didn't prep at all all week. You knew he wouldn't miss. So yeah, give me Fitz. I am all in on uh, on Kirk Cousins. No one picked Russell Wilson. I thought we'd get more Russell Wilson there. Yeah, Russ. First four Russ is always it starts hot, but those guys burn a little hotter. Fair enough. Next one. All right, this is from Junkyard Jake. Junkyard Jake here. Listen. <laughs> Why do all these guys put on characters? Beautiful man, you, Mr. Gale. And you prissy, spineless twat fuck, Mike. <laughs> Just kidding. I love you, Mike. Oh, you're something pretty to look at. But listen, gentlemen. Now that my men, the Bears... Have got their Ryan Poles with the long swinging pole up top and that asshole from Philadelphia to help prop it up because it's bigger than a tripod. <laughs> and you got Matt Eba Flus talking about showing them the whys instead of just searching for them. And that monstrous defense we're going to have with the two scary men on the edge and Roquan Smith up the middle. What do you do in the offseason? Do you sign an interior offensive lineman and try to go after a Godwin or a Devontae Adams or a Ridley, if God knows what that's happening there. And do you draft like a David Bell, Jahan Dotson, something like that in the first? What's your guys' thoughts? And also, fuck you, Mike. We're going to shove it down your throat this season. Justin Fields will be swinging it all over you with your Jordan Love bullshit. My God. I'd love to draft Junkyard Dotson Dave. First. Was that that guy's name? I had a first. Junkyard Jake. Junkyard Jake came and chose violence, dude. Why Why are we getting this trend of like characters? Like these guys come I love on. It. Like it's Keep going. Like we got Keyline Fred, who's hilarious. Great part of the podcast if you've listened to those episodes. Now we got Junkyard Jake coming on and literally like hates you. Well, we broke down last episode. Last episode, right? What was the North? I, I do think offensive lines where I go. And especially with Justin Fields. And now you don't have a first-round pick, so that's going to be tough. I, I, I think I said you pray Zion Johnson falls to you at the top of the second round. I'm not sure that's going to happen. But you just have to get a better protection because, again, like his MO, taking a lot of sacks, the highest sack rate of any quarterback last year, is just a guy who holds on to the football. That's extra split second. And you that's fine as a rookie. That's fine with a second-year player. Guys can potentially grow out of that. But you can't get him killed before he grows. You got to give him the opportunity to grow out of that. You got to give him a situation. So if you're spending money in free agency, yeah, you would love some better wide receivers. But with his style of play, I think you're spending it on the offensive line. You mentioned on the podcast where we talked about what we want to do with Chicago Bears that you might look to like move on from Robert Quinn or move on from Khalil Mack because of the cap situation they're in. Obviously, Junkyard Dave or Junkyard Jake is chasing greatness with those two on the edge. And then you mentioned Roquan Smith in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I like as a Bears fan, you would love to see what those guys can do in Matty Replicit defense, like what that can look like with all those guys healthy. Sure. Uh, and like, you know, lightning in a bottle, galaxy braining, Just Fields turns into you know, year two Patrick Mahomes, yeah, you don't want to trade those guys. But, like, that's the chances of that happening. Uh, if, if they go into the offseason, if they go into the offseason, they can't make the moves they need to make to improve mm -hmm. this offense, specifically the offensive line, without moving on from a Quinn or a Khalil Mack, I think they have to make that sacrifice, right? Like, no one wants to yeah. move on from really talented players. But if you can't help the offense, the number one thing the Bears need to do like, you can't go into next year with the same offensive line or an offensive line that isn't improved. Like, you can't. And I think there's going to be needs, moves need to be made if they move on from Allen Robinson, who's expected to test free NC. If you keep that duo together and you watch this Junkyard Jave, ju Junkyard Jack? Who Jake. 
Jake, Jake. Junkyard Jack led defense. If you watch and it does well and Eberflus leads it up, it doesn't it won't matter if Fields is getting sacked like 70 times. Like it won't matter. So I do think um that they might need to make sacrifices with the talent that they have on defense to help the offense. But if they can find a way, the front office can find a way to have both. And obviously you'd prefer both. Uh, I think we have one more voicemail. And this is a reminder to everyone who's listening to these voicemails. You can leave your own at speakpipe.com slash tailgate. That is speakpipe.com slash tailgate. It's also linked in our bio on anywhere you find your podcast. Last voicemail. Yep. This last one is from Nick. G'day, Mike. G'day, Al Stone. Nick. Uh, Croc Nick from Oz here. My question is a bit of a two to three parter. So, barring guys like Jamal Adams and Derwin James, why do we regularly see NFL teams ignore quality safeties till the second round? Comparatively, we usually see off ball linebackers and DTs go just as high, if not high, who you know, proceed to go to their team and not really move the needle for their defense anyway. Second, right now, by your estimations, give me the over-under on where you think Kyle Hamilton goes. And finally, knowing what you know about NFL teams and what they like to do, what percentage chance do you give that N'Kobe Dean goes ahead of Kyle Hamilton in the draft? Wow. Uh, P.S. Renner, I cried myself to sleep when I heard you cheated on your test to get that job at PFF. I never would have thought someone from a college like Notre Dame would cheat a system like that. Cheating a system set up for fairness, a system set up so that only those truly worthy would get into PFF, so to speak. I used to think you're a class act, Renner. I guess I was wrong. <laughs> um, okay, wait. Can I say this? Yeah. They gave me that login they gave me that information i was just taking advantage of the situation exactly. like if you, if you call that cheating everyone should cheat i call it resourceful exactly like i gotta call it literally trying to get a fucking job yeah. like I, they would want someone if there were answers somewhere that i could just write down it was a test they would call me a dumbass for not doing it it was honestly a test they would call me a dumbass so uh, I, I i mean that's I exactly back. what a cheater i mean would say. I, I did say i did say i cheated so i did like say the word cheat <laughs> So obviously that might have been head, a factor. That could be obviously there was a point of me that part of me that does think I cheated to a degree. I call it maybe a, an advantage that was unfairly bestowed upon myself versus others that others may not take advantage of. That's better the word than cheating. That kind of reminds me of in high school I had a physics teacher who said I don't even remember what the question was. It was like how much I don't remember what the question was, but he said you can use anything in this room to answer it. And he mm -hmm. said the question and then everyone's like scrambling, looking through books and all this stuff to try and figure out like, it was like how much water would your body displace in a bathtub full of 10 gallons or something like that. Yeah. And like, you can use all this stuff. And it's like, at the end of it, like some people got the answer. Some people didn't, whatever. And he's like, no one used a computer. Like my computer's right here. No one came up and used a computer. It's being resourceful. It's thinking about outside the box, which obviously Mike Renner, you do. And you never cheated in your life. Uh, he had three questions there. His first one was, why do we feel that safeties are often devalued and not drafted until day two? That one's tough. Actually. I I'm. I'm not 100% sure. I think the biggest biggest reason would be that scheme specificity. That like one scheme is going to ask a guy to do one specific role that might not be what he played in college, might not be what another scheme is going to do, ask him to do in the NFL. And so you, you have vastly different valuations then of that position or and not even just valuations, but like vastly different things you're looking for. At that position i think another thing is just how comfortable you feel projecting guys from college to the nfl and that again it goes back to maybe they weren't playing this sp specific role maybe they weren't asked to do a lot of the things uh at the collegiate level that they'll have to do at the nfl level and i think the last thing is there's not involved in a lot of plays if you are a deep safety you're kind of a lot of times you're i call it a placeholder like you are going to a spot and staying there and a lot of times it, doesn't matter uh, if you get to that spot, you don't get the ball thrown at you. So like a, a lot of it is uh, purely, I will say mental, but like a lot of it is just doing her job assignment. So like physical tools and like how you go above and beyond. A lot of teams aren't necessarily all that excited or don't need that or aren't looking for that safety position, whereas other positions they are. Is it not also because the opportunity you have 
to impact or like positively make game changing plays is like limited is unless you're like this freak like Earl Thomas. Like, well, that's what little... I just said. Like it's you're not involved in a lot of plays. You're not involved in nearly as many plays as other positions. The other question he had, I believe, one was oh no, what was your over under for how Hamilton goes? Oh, over under six. Six, really? So you don't think he gets past the Panthers? Well, that's my over under. <laughs> You're just upsetting the line. Oh, you're just setting the line. Oh, yeah. Why, why the Panthers? Why is that the line? I think that's a fair spot because I, I don't think the Panthers are going to draft him, but I think either Giants could with their first pick, Giants could with their second pick. That's where my – I like I like, I like like um, seven and a half. I think the Jets could and the Texans could. So. Yeah. I think seven and a half is where I set the line because I think that second Giants yeah. pick at seven overall feels like – his his floor for me right now, but obviously a lot to change. Last thing, and then what, the Nicobe Dean. There you go. Ask it. And what then. what percentage chance do you feel is there for Nicobe Dean to go ahead of Kyle Hamilton? Low, I'd say low because for as much as they don't love safeties, the NFL does not love drafting six foot, two hundred twenty five pound linebackers either. You know, you Devin White went fifth. And he's obviously six foot, but he's like two forty. You know. Devin Bush was like 235 or something, like, somewhere in that range. Those guys were bigger dudes. So undersized, limited length, I'd put it at about a 5% chance that Nicobe Dean goes higher than Cal Hamilton. What, what was the official percentage, the official number? 5%. 5%. 1 in 20. 1 in 20. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. Uh, let's get to the... Trivia questions, literally the ones written on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for all those that left a voicemail. Speakpipe.com slash tailgate is where you can get those. Where is the Gator Mail? Did you prep Gator Mail here? No. no you didn't? No. I thought it was gonna... Gator Mail. Oh, you're only doing voicemails today? Yeah, that was voicemails. Okay. We have the mailbag. We got bonus episode tomorrow. Bonus episode tomorrow. You're right. Let's get to Shout trivia out. then. Trivia? All right. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, first one is from our guy, Perk. Obviously, Perk Angel. Uh, he he says Joe Burrow missed out on the opportunity to become the first QB to win the Heisman Trophy, national championship, and the Super Bowl. However, three non QBs have accomplished this feat already. Name the most recent player to do this, and you get a bonus if you can name the other two. Part of me wanted to say Charles Woodson, but I don't think Michigan won the national championship. He didn't win a Super Bowl, obviously, but he might probably missed that one. What is the other part? Do you want to say? I don't know. I'm trying to think of another part. I'm trying to think of another part. I, I'm not going to commit to Charles Woodson. I don't think Charles Woodson did it. Hmm. I don't know if that's a wise decision. Okay, it's Charles Woodson? It is Charles Woodson. He yeah, won a national championship? Was national he the most recent? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, he's the most recent. I didn't, realize, I didn't realize uh, Michigan won a national championship. Did Michigan win Who the other two? With, uh, Greasy? Um, hmm. Other two, so it would be before Woodson. Uh, yeah, it's kind of throwing it back. Dude, not QBs. Oh, you're throwing it back for us, Quinn? Yeah, he's... <laughs> Yeah, he's in the Super Bowls. Running backs. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Maybe Herschel Walker. Negative. No. Damn it. I'm trying to think of running backs that have even won. Oh, uh, Reggie Bush? Negative. Before that, Jesus. Okay. Maybe Sorry. 2000s. You just said Woodson. He was the most recent one. So uh, that's true. Yeah, okay. also Reggie Bush doesn't have a Heisman. Oh, so. that's on me. That's on me. That's on me. Uh, let's go Earl Campbell. Mm -mm. I don't fucking know. I have no idea. I don't know either. Yeah. Marcus Allen mm. okay. and Tony Dorsett. Mm. Mm. That Marcus was kind Allen, of Raiders legend. I feel like old running backs, this is going to sound terrible, but I was born in 1990. I probably started watching football that I can like remember. Mid-90s, Barry Sanders, whatever. Marcus Allen, Earl Campbell, Tony Dorsett. I couldn't tell you anything about it. They all feel the same to me. They all feel like the same guy. I know it's probably horrible to say, but yeah. yeah, sports before like although I guess those guys were about after nineteen seventy, but sports before nineteen seventy don't count. Wow. There you go. Uh <laughs> next question. Cooper Cup became the ninth wide receiver to win Super Bowl MVP. Who were the last three? Oh, uh, Desmond Howard. Did Desmond Howard win it? He did. That was ninety seven. Ah. It's that it's a ways back. That would Desmond Howard did, but he is not one of the answers. Gosh darn it. Uh Santonio Holmes? Yeah. Two thousand eight. Mm. Heinz Ward? Yep. yep. Two thousand five. And 
Is there a more recent one or is that? Yeah, more recent more one. More recent one. 2018. Oh. Not that long ago. I blanked on the year. Ed- Edelman? Yeah, Julian Edelman. Wow. Well done. I was hot. You guys ready for the last one? Let's do it. Which team has been to four Super Bowls and never held a lead? It's been to four Super Bowls and never held a lead? Isn't that the Bills? Negative. Oh, wow. This four Super Bowls and like never a, held a lead. Teams that won on the last. From Lance Storer on Twitter, by the way. So they probably Shout out didn't, didn't, they probably won one, but didn't lead, lead for a second. That was like a final kick type of situation. Yeah, probably. <laughs> he wanted like final kicks. Giants? Negative. Yeah. I have no idea. Never held a lead in four Super Bowls? Not the Bengals. I don't think they've been to four. No, only three. <laughs> and they were up three with uh, know, like know, three minutes left. Come on. <laughs> um, pass. I was thinking of this. Come on, we can think of Oh, God. NFC. NFC. I don't know. I don't know. Vikings. Oh, oh Vikings. wow. There we go. I never actually won. Vikings. That's going to do it for trivia. Next time we hear from you, it'll be the bonus mailbag, a full episode just answering Apple Podcasts and Spotify reviews. Appreciate everyone that submits to the mailbag, whether it's a voicemail through speakpipe.com slash tailgate or by reviewing a podcast. Really appreciate it. Thanks again. Austin Gale, Mike Renner, tailgate. Now joining the tailgate podcast is Penn State's Arnold Ebiketti coming off a very impressive senior bowl. I know you're down there in Arizona right now, but uh, really want to start off with your senior bowl, man. How do you think things went and what were some of the bigger things you learned from that experience? Uh, I thought it was fun, honestly. I mean, getting back to playing football, getting back to being out there. And one specific thing that I learned going against uh, uh, NFL coaches, you know, was, I was I was on the national team getting coached by the Jack. You know, just seeing how people move and kind of ha- having the NFL scheme, you know, it's kind of having a step ahead for uh, what's coming forward in the NFL. And I know such a big part of the Senior Bowl are these one-on-one opportunities, those pass rusher one-on-one opportunities. How do you think th- you fared in those? And I guess what did you learn from that experience, whether it was from the coaches or even just working with some of the other, you know, top offensive tackle prospects? I think it all comes down to learning who you're going against because different tackle have different set. So it just comes down to knowing your opponent and knowing what strategy you're going to use moving forward on how to attack some of those tackles. Yeah, I think that's something that doesn't get discussed a ton at the Senior Bowl, right? In these one-on-ones, you don't have a lot of opportunities yeah. to watch these guys tape. You don't get an opportunity to like set up a lot of moves. I think one of the practices, they were letting guys go twice in a row while others were only letting go once, and then you had to face a yeah. different tackle. So that must have been – I mean, that is a difficult component of those one-on-one drills. Moving forward now, you're in Arizona. You're obviously training for upcoming combine, upcoming pro day. How is that training going uh, so far? It's doing well. Been down here since January, so every day just trying to take one step at a time, get better, uh, getting closer to reaching some of the goals that I have for myself. Mm-hmm. And are you? Do you have any like current goals, whether that be for the weight that you're trying to land at, or even goals for some of the drills that you're prioritizing? Trying to be around that 250, 255 area. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the way I played at the whole season. That's kind of the way I feel comfortable. So just trying to stay around that area. And I know a lot of times talking to guys who are training for the combine, training for the pro day, they don't have a lot of opportunities to watch film, right? Go back and watch film of themselves. Have you had any opportunities to go back and watch some of the Penn State tape and critique yourself? Or have you kind of just been locked into the athletic testing diet, et cetera? I mean, that's all I do. I mean, late at night, uh, I have a lot of time to myself. Try, I mean, I love watching film. I was trying to go back, watch some film of myself, see some of the things that I didn't do as well and try to find ways to correct it. I mean, when you do that, you just learn so much about yourself and you realize that if you were to go back, you would have you done uh, some of those things different. So I'm just excited. I mean, see some of the mistakes that I do in front of, try to correct them and having the opportunity to go to the next level, hopefully I get to fix those mistakes. Going back to the Senior Bowl a bit, I know 
there are a lot of opportunities to meet with teams in that span. And a lot of those questions are about you and the type of player that you are. But did you have any opportunities to watch your film with some of those NFL teams? Or I know some of those questions are also saved for the combine. So I haven't had the opportunity to watch the senior ball film because I mm-hmm. did not have access to the film. I mean, we watched it with the coaches after the practices, but it's okay. up going. as of right now, I did not have access to the film. Gotcha. How about watching NFL tape? Are there any NFL edge rushers that you pattern your game after or you watch in the summer, for example, to like pick up some moves and those things? I mean, there's a couple. You talk about uh, TJ Watt, someone that's very technical, uh, cross chop, uh, long arm. And you have, I was watching Von Miller last night, some of those spin moves that he was doing. You know, just, I watched a lot of different edge rushers trying to gra- grab little things that he, some of the things that he do well and add that to your game. That's, that's one of the main things I do. Were you at all surprised at the Super Bowl result? Von Miller, Aaron Donald wreaking havoc all the way up to the final play and the Los Angeles Rams winning. Is that how you saw it or, or how, how was your Super Bowl experience? I think that's how everybody saw it. You know, um, the D line that the Rams have, we talk about Aaron Donald, Ron Mill, uh, some of those guys up front. I mean, they they they, they have a serious problem up front. So I mean, I was it was just so exciting watching those guys and some of the moves that it was doing. I mean, just talking about pass rush itself, it just it, it, it's an art. 100%. I mean, that that final play from Aaron Donald, how quickly he's able to win at the snap and the vers- the variety of moves this kid has. I mean, it's just absurd what Aaron Donald has done to the league. It's made it's made everyone, you know, kind of surprised at like what what yeah. defensive linemen are capable of, honestly. Going back to your career at Penn State, uh, a player that I've had on this podcast before, someone I was super impressed with both on the field and in that interview as a leader and kind of as a as a vocal leader for Penn State is Jaquan Brisker. Speak to the relationship you have with Brisker and I guess the impact he had on this Penn State defense? I mean, he's a dog, man. You, there's not much you can say about it. He's a dog. He's someone that loves football. And I know going back to me first transferring to Penn State, he one of the, the first guys that I met. Uh, talking about a leader on the team and lining up every Saturday looking at having guys like Jaquan next to you. I mean, you just, I mean, you want to go out there and play for him. And I know he goes out there, we play for each other. And I, I mean, I could have been more proud to have a teammate like him, someone that, you know, is going to come out and give 100% every day. Someone else that I want to see, you know, what your relationship was, and I guess the impact that he's had on your career as you developed at Penn State is head coach James Franklin. I know a lot of people there at Penn State speak really highly of him and how much he's not only just able to recruit talent to Penn State, but also develop talent there at Penn State. Well, I mean, Coach Franklin, he's a great coach. He's one of those guys that's going to bring the best out of you. Uh, he, he gave me an opportunity. He trusted me. And all I had to do was go on out there and, and follow the process. That's exactly what I did. In this you know, pre-draft experience, only a couple more questions for you, and then I'll let you go, Arnold. Really appreciate the time. Everyone is going to be asked, you know, telling you the type of player you are, right? Everyone's like, Arnold does yeah. this. Arnold wins with this move and that move. What would you say kind of separates you in this edge class? And what would you say describes you or kind of do your best describing yourself as a player? Uh, I say my, my versatility. You know, I'm obviously, uh, one of the things that I do best is rush the passer, and I feel personally I can do a lot more, play the run, even be in coverage. And it's not really one aspect that you can pinpoint and kind of describe what type of player I am. I think it's a lot more to my game, and that's just what I'm looking forward to showing at the next level. Last one for you. What are some of your on-field and off-the-field goals once you get into the NFL? Obviously, there's a lot of opportunity on the football field, things like defensive rookie of the year and immediately making an impact, winning a Super Bowl. But also, I'd love to hear you know, when you're given that opportunity and that platform in the NFL, what are some of the off-the-field goals that you have um, once you get there? Uh, I mean, talking about on-the-field goal, you know, you talking about the NFL, you have some of the greatest uh, talent. I mean, you talk about the best football player there is, and you get the options to go out there and, and compete against those guys and test your skill set. You don't get better than that. It's, it's the best of the best when you talk about a uh, competitive uh, standpoint. And talking about off the field, you know, got to give back to the community, kind of uh, continue to inspire those guys going back to my high school. Those people that probably didn't see the opportunity for them to make it this far and being in this position, having the possibility to inspire them is kind of, it's kind of big for me. 
and just give it back to them, let them know that if I did, I mean, if they believe in their dream, they can do the exact same thing. Fantastic stuff, Arnold. I really appreciate the time, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Appreciate that. Thank you. Now joining the Tailgate Podcast is Clemson Whiteout, Justin Ross. Justin, uh, thanks for joining the show. Thanks for having me, man. Thanks for having me. Had some technical difficulties to start, but we are rolling on through. I know you're uh, based in Dallas right now working with Exos, um, going through the training process, preparing preparing for the combine, preparing for the pro day, and you're coming off a little bit of a stress fracture. How has that re- rehabilitation process gone, and how healthy are you feeling right now knowing that we have combine pro days coming up? Uh, it's been pretty smooth for real. Like it's it's a real common injury, so I, I wasn't really too worried about like the the rehab process for real. So like yeah, it, it's been like probably like a month and a half, and I'm I'm clear now. I'm ready to go. That's that is awesome to hear. And you are listed on Clemson website six foot four two oh five. What weight did you play at this past season? And in the in in the off season, is there a weight you're working up to as you prepare for obviously the weigh in and the combine itself? Um, this past season, I probably played I played around like 204, 205 range, and I'm trying to get uh like I, I my past seasons I've been I've been playing at like 210, so yeah, that, I'm, I'm probably trying to get back to that way. I, I I am back to that way actually. Yeah, that's I mean I think that big frame is going to be what a lot of NFL teams are looking at when they're looking to big, big, bring in a receiver like All yourself. Right. Going back a little bit, we'll talk about 2021, we'll talk about 2019 and how those seasons went at Clemson. I want to talk about your true freshman season there where you were in a 90 plus PFF grade over you know, had 1000 yards receiving on 46 receptions, really hit the college football landscape with a massive massive impact. Were you at all surprised at the success you had that early on? What do you credit that success to, right? How much of that was Clemson and this offense and then putting you in a position to succeed, but also how much of it was you and, and you just coming in, you know, prepared enough to, ha- to have that kind of impact as a true freshman for Clemson? Uh, I feel like coming in, like I, I, I had to prove a point just because I was leaving the state. Everybody had doubted me for real. Like everybody wanted me to go to Bama and everything like that. So I feel like I had to prove a point. So I, I, I was real, like I, I was, I was working, I was working for real, trying mm-hmm. to just Trying to get, trying to just basically just get my name out there for real, because everybody knew me from high school. I made a couple ESPN catches in high school, so like, I mean, I, I was trying to keep keep it going. Mm-hmm. It's, 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 it's easy to build up a name, but it's hard. You feel me? Keep it going. So no, for one hundred percent. Talk to me more about your recruiting process and and your decision to go to Clemson. How was that? Uh, it was it was a little shaky for real, just because of like being it being an in home guy and Clemson was my. I, my top three schools was Alabama, Auburn, and Clemson. So with Clemson being the only out of state, it was a little shaky just with the pressure from the in-state schools. But yeah, I'm mad. That's that's wild, man. I can't imagine being as good of a high school football player as yourself in the state of Alabama. And then I I'm sure, and you kind of spoke to it there, but you make the decision not to go to Bama or Auburn. Those fan yeah. bases will come after you, man. We give me some oh, examples yeah. of. I mean, I'm sure social media just had to be absurd. Any like funny stories from that period or like wild social media occurrences that happened when you made that decision? Oh, uh, I, I don't even remember like that though. But it's but nah, it was some crazy. It was some crazy stuff. For real, for real. Like, whatever you can think of, like it, it, it was some. It could have been something like this. That's incredible, man. Well, you've obviously had opportunities to um, you know, develop at Clemson and move beyond that 2018 season. Weren't able to take the field in 2020, but in 2021 showed a lot of the things that we saw uh, from that 2018 season. Where do you feel your game has developed the most over the course of your Clemson career? And I guess, where would you say are the areas that you've improved the most going from that 2018 season and now as you prepare for the draft? Um, I feel like I just develop more mentally for real, just just learning how to read defenses and stuff like that. Cause like, I feel like a, a, a dude with me, like a big big frame like this you, with, with all the tools, I mean, what all you gotta do is be a smart player. Mm-hmm. So I feel like I learned, I learned the game more mentally. Going into the combine, you're obviously going to have this opportunity to show the type of athlete you are and the different testing and those things. But another big part of that is this interview process, sitting down with NFL teams, going into those interviews. Is there an area of your game or even your, uh, you know, a part of yourself on or off the field that you're hoping to prove there, right? What are you hoping for teams to come away with when they sit down with you or when they meet you at the combine? Um. Like physically, I I just want to show show my long my long speed. Really, that, that's 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 the big thing for me. Just just to prove that I have I have that long speed, and I'm and I'm not just a jump ball guy. Mm-hmm. 
And then how about off the field, right? What kind of person is a team getting in Justin Ross, right? What is this What is this personality that they're bringing into the locker room? Oh, great hard working. Going to always be about his business. Going to come in and, and, and handle stuff accordingly. That's awesome, man. Yeah, I love that. Um, going back to you know the receiver position specifically, talking to receivers and defensive backs, they often refer to the passing game as this like game within a game, right? A chess match where you have to set up routes, set up releases, these different things. Right. Do you view the game similarly, Similarly, right? Are you going into every matchup knowing that you have to set up these releases? And I guess speak to that game within a game that is you know, wide receiver versus quarterback. I mean, uh, I mean, of course you're going to watch film on a person, get a little feel for them. For real, for real, but I really just I, I I go in I go in the game and just attack off the muscle just to get just to get a little feel feel for what what, what the corner gonna do or anything like that. So yeah, yeah it, it's, it's really all in like your your game mentality for real. You you brought up film in a given game week. How much film of a cornerback or an opposition are you watching? And then do you ever have opportunities to even watch film on yourself? Do you watch film of yourself and and critique your own gameplay, whether that's in the game week or even in the off season? Oh yeah, oh yeah, all the time, all the time. I, I, even after practice, I'll go, I, I'll go up like right, right when they put the practice film up, and just, just see, and just see some of the stuff that I that I did wrong on, on film. I mean, you're you gonna mess up this practice, man. Mm-hmm. Just, just, yeah, just see, just see different things that I need to improve, bro. Like I, right after practice, bro. A special receiver that came out of Clemson that you've had opportunities to work with is T. Higgins. Obviously, came up short in the Super Bowl, but had an absurd run with the Cincinnati Bengals this past season. What's your relationship like with T? And how impressed have you been with his NFL career thus far? Oh man, T, that, that's my brother, man. We 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 been been through a lot together. Like in the what did we play like two years, two years together, yeah. In the last two years, but I mean, I expect I expected everything. I expected him to do everything that he did for real in the last two seasons that he had for real, because he, he's just that kind of athlete for real, and, yeah. and that's and that's how the football plays. Last one for you, Justin. I'll let you go. I really appreciate the time. We've we've brought a film watching yourself and watching the opposition, but who are some of your favorite guys in the NFL to watch, right? And if they are these guys, what do you ever watch them to take some of their skills or take some of their uh, their technique and stuff like that and pattern your game after them? Um, I say my my favorite somebody that that I try to model my game after is probably like Keenan Keenan Allen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Keenan and, Allen. Then. Yeah, Keenan Keenan Coop, Amari Cooper and probably Devontae. Those are those are three fantastic receivers. No no surprises there, man. Keenan Allen, all those guys, fantastic. Justin, really appreciate the time, and I wish you the best of luck moving forward. Yes, sir. Appreciate you.